I'd like to welcome everyone to the October 2022 edition of NDSU Extension Agribusiness's Agricultural Market Situation Outlook uh, webinar. A uh, lot going on, uh, really uh, exciting times, almost as always, it seems, since we ever kicked this thing off. Uh, for those of you who might be new, uh, we will be happy to answer questions at the end. We encourage questions, uh, but we'll have a, a series of presentations uh, followed by that Q&A. You can enter any questions you might have during uh, the talks uh, using, we prefer the, chat, the, the Q&A tool, but you can also use the chat. Uh, and with that, I'd like to kick it over to Brian Parman, Egg Finance Specialist. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> so uh, uh, I think in my last talk, we talked about land values. Um, this one, a uh, fresh inflation uh, report and some economic numbers came out this morning and yesterday. And so I kind of want to go over that and some of the Federal Reserve's response since they'll be meeting here in a few weeks again to uh, discuss their policies and the actions that they're going to take regarding um, the federal funds rate and eventually impacting interest rates and so forth. So, and this is pretty much uh, uh, for September, but we're kind of ending the, the third quarter here and rolling into the fourth. Uh, so I wanted to uh, cover that today. So here were the headlines this morning. Uh, the numbers for the consumer uh, price index or consumer inflation came out this morning. Uh, the producer or the kind of wholesale and intermediate inflationary numbers came out uh, yesterday. And well, these are some of the headlines I just picked off uh, really fast. They were they were gain, gaining a lot of attention and a lot of reads. Uh, and essentially what happened was the expectation was for inflation to be considerably above 8% uh, coming out of September. Uh, it turns out that it was a, a, a bit higher. Um, so the month of September's inflation was expected to be 3%, which is fairly high, but it turned out to be, or three tenths of a percent, 0.3, just for the month, turned out to be 0.4. And so uh, that kind of, it was expected that it was going to be high, but it was actually high, even higher than that still. So that triggered some uh, actions in, in some of the markets, uh, including the, the stock market and, and uh, interest rates. Now, wholesale inflation, these are going to be kind of your intermediate goods, uh, uh, things that companies are going to use perhaps to turn into final goods that, that consumers actually purchase, raw materials and so forth. Uh, wholesale inflation in September was up, uh, which was pretty much double what the expected wholesale inflation was going to be. And uh, the yearly uh, producer price uh, index inflationary number was eight and a half percent, which was which was, again, a big kind of an eye opener. And uh, August year over in year inflation was 8.7. So it's actually been um, down off the highs in July for both consumer and uh, producer uh, prices, but not coming down anywhere near as fast as anyone thought it would. And in fact, it's kind of staying persistently uh, above that 8% mark um, uh, for the last several months, which is something they're really looking at. Um, so if we look at the yearly producer price uh, inflation for final goods. So these are goods that producers are making and that are selling then to consumers. So the price of uh, inputs that, that they would take and then and then go ahead and sell. Uh, and this is a uh, total. So the total is the green line and then goods, goods less food and energy, which are more volatile. And that number again has been, you know, just, just stacked pretty high uh, over the last year, uh, including, you know, it kind of, it was the highest over the summer but it hasn't come down uh, nearly as fast as folks thought it would. And typically when we talk about inflation, what the Federal Reserve likes to see in the governing bodies is around 2%. That's kind of a, a benchmark that they set. And since uh, January of you know May, May of 21, it started to creep up last fall and, and peaked again in, in the summer so far. And, and I'll talk about it in a minute, but some folks are starting to think that inflation may have peaked and is starting to ebb lower, even though the, the report was higher than expected, that perhaps the Federal Reserve's actions are working and uh, uh, there's a reduction taking place. So here's for intermediate goods. Again, th these would be goods that, that uh, producers are using, whether they're making uh, steel or something like that, they're gonna take in raw materials, make an intermediate good, and then that would go uh, to somebody who makes a final good that that consumers actually buy. These might even an intermediate good might be something like a microchip that goes into a TV and the TV is the final good, or into a computer which is the final good. 
And that inflationary number again peaked earlier uh, last year and has been kind of coming down. It resurged again in the, in the summer, but uh, still remaining fairly high uh, as well. So here is the 12 month percentage change for consumer prices. And the lines are kind of similar in color, I understand, but the all items, less food and energy, that's what they call core inflation. Uh, that's staying up, up, getting closer to 6% and uh, overall inflation, which does include food and energy and energy being a big driver and food. Both of those are well above uh, the core inflation number has, has showing to stay in that eight, eight, low, eight point two, eight point three percent range uh, uh, for the, for the month of September. And, and again, I wanted to just show this. This is the year over year for uh, uh, the major items that go into the inflationary number. Um, so you got all items on the left. That's in the red. Uh, food is blue. And, and so it's been up over 10% year over year. But energy is the big one. And it's all energy is approaching, uh, has, has kind of stayed around 20%. Some other, and when you drill down, you can get to like fuels and uh, fuel oil, uh, natural gas. Some of those have been a, a bit mixed. Some are 30% uh, year over year. Some are less than that. But energy as a whole around 20%. And then here's that core inflation number again, around around five and a half percent. So, one of the things that's happened this year too is uh, investors and and folks in the market have been kind of spooked by these inflationary numbers that the Federal Reserve was going to have to eventually start taking aggressive action, increasing the federal funds rate, thereby reducing the uh, stock markets growth or, or actually re reducing the, the value of the stock market overall, because a lot of what's built into any stock purchase price is, uh, is uh, the potential for growth. And if interest rates are too high, borrowing becomes prohibitive, cost prohibitive, can't grow as fast. Therefore, that value comes down and the overall uh, value of the market falls. And the high was reached, uh, the record was uh, January 4th um, of, of this last year, 2022, and it was almost 30 uh, 36,800 nearly. Um, and this morning it opened, uh, uh below 30,000, but interestingly, this is what happened on the day, uh, despite this hotter than, uh, expected inflation report. And despite inflation staying persistent, uh, the Dow actually rallied 800 points since the time I, uh, started looked at it this morning and, uh, this presentation. So you're getting up to the minute info up to the, or as close as I can get. And the belief with that is that uh, folks in the market are starting to think, at least this was the explanation that the, the best explanation I uh, could find was <clears throat> that a lot of people are thinking that inflation's peaked, that we're possibly on the backside of it, uh, and that these aggressive Federal Reserve actions aren't going to have to continue too much longer. And how long that is, is anyone's guess but optimism that, that inflation is going to start coming down. That's what, that's what today's rally is. But these, these markets are extremely volatile as frame can attest and the, and, and, and folks in ag can attest in, in the commodities market. You get one piece of news, you get this massive rally. Uh, the news turns out to be, or, uh, the, the sentiment or the, the, the idea, uh, becomes not true. And then all of a sudden you get a massive crash. Uh, that, that seems to happen all the time. So this was the reaction here. And that's, I guess, folks tended to take a, a silver lining to the report that came out and, and therefore we had a big rally. Now, just moving on to the Federal Reserve <clears throat> discussion, which is the last part here real quick. So the Fed is actually, if you read the minutes <clears throat> from their meetings and, and kind of gives you an idea of what they're thinking, they've taken more of a, what they call a hawkish tone uh, towards slowing inflation, which you, you could think of it as an aggressive tone to slowing inflation or a, uh, uh, stern tone, if you will. So the neutral federal funds rate, uh, just to give a little history on it, is believed to be about two and a half percent. We've been below that. We had been below that for quite a long time, but that's supposed to be, that's neither restrictive nor accommodative uh, in terms of the market. That, that rate makes it so that it's not promoting or stimulating growth, but it's also not slowing it either with, with rates that are prohibitively high. So this year, what's basically happened, we started off the year at about a quarter of a percent. That's where it was in March, uh, while inflation was, was increasing into that six and 7% range. So in the March meeting, the Fed increased the rate from uh, a quarter of a point 
to from a, from 0.25 to 0.5 percent. Then the May increase was inflation continued to not only persist but increase, went up a half a percentage point to one percent. So still accommodative and still below the neutral rate, but but increasing. Then in June, uh, we started seeing this big inf these big inflation numbers, high eights approaching nine percent. Federal funds, uh, the Fed decided to increase rates uh, three quarters of a point, so we went to 1.75. Then again in July, another three quarter of a point increase to two and a half percent. And then in September, another three quarter of a point increase. And this is where we sit now at this 3.25 percent, which is considered to be restrictive or more hawkish. And then the expectations for the November meeting uh, right now, and this changed dramatically. There was kind of a split on when they if they would increase it. Uh, in a few weeks, three quarters of a point or half a point. Uh, and if you do the three quarter of a point increase, it goes up to four. And so this is the percentages based on the market expectations of what the Fed's going to do. And 97% of people believe that, uh, that that deal with this all the time and are watching this in the financial sectors, uh, that they're going to do a three quarter of a point increase in the next meeting, especially given the most recent uh, inflationary number. And so it's going to drive it up to uh, about 4%. And then a small minority think that maybe they'll do even more like an entire percentage point. Now looking forward, um, and this is the challenge with it. It's it's not that the market is, is unsure what the Fed will do. It's that the market's unsure what the inflationary number is going to be for the next, over the next few months, how high inflation is going or how long it's going to persistently stay where it is. And, and they kind of expect the reaction to be that three quarters of a point increase if it stays high. So that's why you get these percentages. So this is for February. And before this morning's numbers came out, uh, 5% five, uh, 5 to 5.25% wasn't even on the table. And a minority thought that it would be 4.75 to 5% uh, by February. Now that's become a majority, and then all of a sudden this became a real possibility to some some in the market that it's going to be over over five and a quarter. And it seems like I, I if you I, I, you probably don't track this as often as I do and look at it before these numbers come out, but it's really interesting to watch how this has shifted to the right. If you go back and look at this same uh, chart in the summer, there was zero chance. I mean that it would even be four and a half to four point seven five percent. I mean it, the the likelihoods were in the threes for February, three, three and a half percent. But as this inflation has persisted month over month over month, the expectation for the federal funds rate has just continued to shift uh, higher and higher and higher uh, as the year pro uh, progresses. So then how, what does that really mean? Well, right now we're looking at about a 7% interest rate for 30 year mortgages. And I use those as a proxy for, you know, what farmers might get on farmland. Um, I know it's not a, exactly a one for one deal, but as they're increasing, other interest rates tend to increase with it as well. Uh, and the 30 year is something that's tracked a lot more heavily than, than some of the ag loans. But 7% uh, is, is, is just about where it's at right now for a 30 year, a 15 year around six, and then a five one arm around 5.8. And the relationship continues it is pretty strong between what the Fed does, the 10 year note, uh, especially and 10 year yields actually crested 4% uh, for the first time in, in, in 14 years this morning when this inflationary number came out. And so it, if those Fed actions tend to be true that are that, that I showed before, if the market is 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 correct on it, we're probably going to see that number continue to to increase up to perhaps even a seven and a half, eight percent uh, uh, interest rate on on 30 year mortgages for for most borrowers. Um, so that's that's something to watch, especially as we head into next year. We're talking about operating notes. We're talking about new equipment purchases, land purchases, you know, big ticket items that you're going to pay over time. Uh, that's going to have an impact. And it's been quite a long time since anyone has had to worry about interest as a real cost. Uh, in, in terms of expansion and borrowing. Uh, but if we get into that eight, nine and 10% range and all of a sudden it starts chewing up a pretty big chunk of uh, anyone's budget who's actually looking to expand or trade off equipment. But again, it's going to depend on what the numbers coming out of October are, or yeah, October and then November and December. If, the, if these numbers stay in the 8% range above eight and, and even continue to uh, uh, be higher than what market uh, participants are expecting, 
uh, I wouldn't expect the Fed to slow down at all based on the comments that they've uh, they've made re uh, on this topic. So I know that was a kind of a down and dirty there on, on what's happened and uh, kind of the expectations going forward. But as always, uh, I'll be on later uh, at the end. Uh, use the chat to answer any questions that I can uh, on this topic of inflation and federal uh, in, uh, funds rates. It's a complex topic in a lot of ways. And so uh, it's sometimes tough to cover in, in about 15 minutes, but uh, hopefully that gives you some insight on what's happening. And uh, with that, I believe our next speaker is uh, Dr. Olson will be giving us a crops update. So let me stop the sharing. All right, uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Frank Olson, I'm a crop economist, marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, I'm gonna give you a brief update on the WASDU report, the report we got yesterday, some of the information there, um, as well as some other things going on in particular in transportation and logistics. So some of the things we might be facing as, as we move through the rest of harvest. So first, uh, uh, an update on production estimates. Uh, so the row on the top highlighted in blue is what the, the trade was expecting to see. So there's always a survey done before the USDA releases their information of private analysts and private forecasters on what do you expect the numbers to be. Uh, so to be honest with you, those are the numbers that are currently in the marketplace. So we really need to compare the, the blue line versus the red line on the very bottom, which is the actual numbers we got out of USDA. So blue line, this is what the trade was expecting to see. Red line is what we actually got. I did highlight in black uh, the report we had last month, just again, as, as another reference point. So when we look at corn for both the yield per acre, the national average yield, as well as the production numbers, they came in very, very close to what the uh, pre-report estimates, what the trade is expecting to see. So we were expecting to see a slight cutback in a national average yield, and we got that. Now, again, just as a reminder for everybody, the October and November, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, yes, the October, September, October, and November uh, production estimates are use three sources of information, uh, farmer surveys, as well as what they call uh, remote sensing or satellite imagery, as well as objective yield estimates. So they actually, the USDA sends, hires people, they send them out to randomly chosen fields to actually do yield counts, just like a crop, crop insurance adjuster would do. They combine that information by state as well at the national level to try and come up with these national estimates for both production and, and yields. Um, so we'll have one more round of this where we have all three sources of information before we, we uh, take a break and wait until after harvest is completed. And then there's some more follow-up survey work that's done in December and early January. So on the corn side, the production numbers were pretty much what, they, what the, the trade was expecting. On the soybean ledger, uh, again, very similar to what we were expecting to see. There was uh, a slight reduction, I guess, in the production number, and, and there were some adjust, just some small adjustments that were made there. But the moral of the story is the numbers that came in from the, the production uh, side of the ledger, very, very close to what, what the trade is expecting to see and, and well within the trading range. There were some surprises, however, on the um, forecast for ending stocks. We're looking at, we take all the production, subtract out all of our intended uses, USDA forecasts, how much do we believe we're going to have in the bins or in the in the system just before harvest of next year? So there's a lot of forecasting that's done, in particular on the consumption or usage side at this stage of the game. Now, since the September report and then now this October report, we got some more information. So on September 30th, we got two important reports. First, the small grains report, which provides the final numbers for production and yields for all the wheat classes, the small grains, uh, wheat, oats, barley. Um, we also got an updated survey of, of, of available supplies or stocks, grain stocks on September 1. The important thing about grain stocks on September 1, that survey is those numbers now become the ending stocks numbers for last year's crop. So the moral of the story, we do one more survey of how much is left in the bin just before harvest. That becomes the ending stocks for last year and becomes the beginning stocks for this coming year. So we take beginning stocks, add in production, add in our imports. We start subtracting out our use to get these bottom line numbers. 
So the moral of the story is there were quite a few adjustments that were made based off of those reports we got on September 30th. So let's compare the blue line on top, the blue, excuse me, the blue row on top versus the red row on the very bottom. So on the wheat side, the, the trade was expecting a, a, um, a, a decrease from last month, a decrease in ending stocks, the forecasted ending stocks, primarily because the total production numbers for wheat, all classes of wheat, came in smaller than we had expected. Okay, so the, in, the, the, the inventories we knew, but the production numbers for 2022 came in lower than we expected. Well, with that expectation then, we knew that USDA was going to adjust some of their usage numbers, the consumption numbers, based on lower supplies. Now, the adjustments in consumption were not as large. The reductions in consumption were really not as large as what the trade was expecting. So on the wheat side, uh, the, the small grains report said we were not going to grow as much wheat as we thought. But as a result, USDA reduced their forecast for wheat exports more than what the trade was expecting. They actually took the exports number on much down a, a lot heavier a lot more aggressively than I think most of the traders were expecting. Or, excuse me, flip that around. They they did not reduce the exports as much as they had expected, okay? So the moral of the story is, bottom line, we have right now projected more ending stocks than we first expected. Therefore, this report yesterday came out was a slightly negative for the wheat complex. Shifting to corn. On the corn side, if you look at the blue number versus red line, Again, our ending stocks numbers were a little bit larger than what the trade was expecting. Notice that we have a very wide range. If you look at the highest trade estimate and the lowest trade estimate, that's a pretty wide range. We're still well within the range, but we're, we're a little bit higher than what the trade average trade was expecting. Now, we did take the, the yield down a little bit on corn, not much from, from the previous month. We also took carry-in, so the inventory from last month coming forward from last year, excuse me, coming forward into this year was a little bit lower than expected. Um, but USDA also cut the exports numbers. So they cut export forecasts for both wheat and for corn. Okay, now because they cut the exports forecasts for corn, we ended up with a little bit more ending stocks than we expected. I guess I think most analysts and traders looked at the number that USDA gave us as saying, well, we are taking our inventories down. Um, you know, we're getting to that point where markets are getting a little bit nervous, but the cut wasn't quite as aggressive as we thought. So I would consider that, in my my opinion, kind of neutral news. And then we had the soybean number. And the soybeans number from yesterday was really, I think, the, the surprise value. Um, so we did take the yield down just a smidge, just a little bit. Again, primarily from last month to this month, we did reduce the yield, but very close to what the trade was expecting. Now, the other thing that happened, though, was that we had carry-in. So again, the carry-in numbers from last, last year into this year were actually higher. Okay, so kind of the, the trade-off we had was we had more carryover from last year, but we brought the yields down. And again, that yield drop was, was the, the compensating factor. So when we wash this all through and get to the bottom line number, the trade was expecting to see a slight increase or, or a little bit more flexibility in our ending stocks in, in soybeans, but we didn't get that. So the 200 million bushels is actually a very tight number on soybeans. So the soybean stocks, the soybean projected uh, uh, inventories this time next year are still expected to be very, very thin. And that was the surprise to the marketplace. We did put some money back about 20 cents or so, 25 cents back into the soybean market yesterday. Um, so. This is kind of, we now hit the reset button on where we think we're at. Um, we'll, we'll watch what's going on in the marketplace as we move forward. And of course, about this time next month, we'll get another update on primarily um, not only the yield numbers, and I expect some mi minor adjustments on yields, but then more importantly, some of the production or consumption numbers, excuse me, the consumption numbers. So what does all this mean for the markets and what the market expectation is. So this is the December corn futures. I pulled this chart at about eight o'clock-ish this morning. 
because uh, I had some meetings leading up until this program, although I was ever tried to get some more current information. But we we were um, off a little bit this morning, but I, I do think the corn market is relatively stable. We've, we've developed this trading range kind of between that about 660 and 7, 706 number. Um, we, we hit that 706 a few days ago, actually the end of last week. Um, so we're kind of in this trading range and, and obviously we're starting to get some harvest pressure now. So the fact that the, the corn market is, is stabilizing and we're still within this trading range, I view that as positive. I know there's still a lot of uncertainty in the grain markets right now and all the things going on geopolitically on the, on the international stage. So I do think that that's, that's also driving some of the market behavior. But the fact that we're, we, we are holding prices right now as harvest comes online, and we're starting to get some of that harvest selling pressure. I think I consider that to be a positive uh, 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 kind of uh, um, mentality or viewpoint in the marketplace. When we look at soybeans, um, as we as we as we started to look at what ha is happening in the soybean market, we have had a slight retracement from September. Um, I know there were some concerns, and in particular about the uh, kind of flowering and pollination and pod set in the. Uh, kind of the the Western Corn Belt, um, and those kind of some of those concerns are still with us. Um, we're starting to get narrow in a little bit better on what our yield and yield potential is. Again, we are within a trading range anywhere from that 1350 to about 1440. Uh, we're kind of right in the middle of that range right now. The thing I'm going to remind everybody on soybeans is that because our ending stocks are so incredibly tight right now, it really wouldn't take a lot of news, either positive or negative, to get us kicked out of that trading range fairly quickly. Again, we're coming into the kind of the, the, the key harvest time period here. The fact that it's holding within that trading range, again, I consider relatively positive. On the wheat side, again, we've got a lot more information about wheat and wheat yields, about the quality profile that we're dealing with. We've got a little bit wider trading range, obviously, on the wheat from you know just before harvest started in mid-August until we see right now. A lot of the volatility, we are in a general uptrend, if you notice, so we have, let me use my cursor here. We are in a general uptrend in the, in the, uh, the wheat market. And a lot of that, uh, again, has to be driven by uh, some of the concerns and issues going on in the war between Russia and Ukraine. So we have to watch in the wheat, we have to watch that situation very closely. I do want to shift gears a little bit now and talk about what's happening logistically and some of our, our uh, supply chain issues, if you will, within the grain flows. Uh, I've been watching this for a while. I think I commented it on some, some previous presentations I have done. One of the concerns we have now is the, that the water levels in the Mississippi River, in particular, the lower part of the Mississippi, just north of New Orleans, um, is, is really at very, very low levels. We're not at record low, but we're getting there very quickly. And so these near record low water levels, again, the emphasis is on the lower Mississippi. So th this is below where the Missouri, um, below St. Louis, where the Missouri enters. Um, <clears throat> there's a, that's a high traffic flow region for, for grain as well as, as fertilizer products. So the fact that we're having these low water levels and we're starting to do some backup of barge and barge traffic as we enter into the peak of our harvest season is really raising some concerns. And I want to, I want to show you some numbers in just a minute, minute to try and emphasize that point. So these lower water levels, they're causing some problems for barge traffic. The National Weather Service is forecasting these water levels to continue to drop for at least another two weeks. So we have not hit the worst of, of the water levels yet. Um, we'll wait to see on rainfall and how quickly we might be able to get some water flow to increase those levels. But we're getting very close to the record lows that were set in October of 1988. And if any of you online remember 1988, and I unfortunately do remember 88 very well, uh, that was some exceptionally dry conditions, not only up here in the Northern Plains where we're at, but also across the nation. Now, to try and, and the biggest challenge with the lower water levels is some of the sandbars. Um, you know, there's a lot of sediment and silt that, go, that ends up. Uh, it makes navigating the river a lot more complex when you when the water levels drop and all of a sudden these 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 sandbars and things start to show up. Obviously, you don't want to ground one of your um, run one of your your barges aground. So they are dredging uh, the Mississippi River, at least in those por in those portions that have the greatest threat and rate greatest risk of, of stoppages. Um, dredging takes a while. They do open things up. 
Uh, there are two points right now that are kind of the choke points, the, the greatest concern. One is near Memphis, Tennessee. The other one is near Stack Island, Mississippi. Um, and, and there tends to be some curves in, the, in the, the, the rivers at that point. Again, those are some areas where we start to see some more sediment building up. So they are dredging those. They're trying to open things up to try and regain um, some of the throughput and the capacity along the river. Um, as of a couple days ago, this is the most recent information I could find, there were 22 towboats that were stranded. There was about 392 barges. So again, each, each boat or each tugboat uh, will be able to transport uh, a certain number of barges. So this is uh, these are not huge numbers. They're lower than they were uh, about a week prior. Uh, previously, there was almost 100 tows that were either stalled or grounded. Um, which with a lot more of the of the barges being being um, having trouble. So it is getting better, but the fluidity and the and the flow is not as good as we'd like to see. The other thing that's happening is the barge companies are putting on draft restrictions. Actually, the Corps of Engineers are putting on some draft restrictions. So that has two components to it. Um, first, it's how heavily can you load each one of the barges? So right now, most of the barges are, are reduced by about 20%. So they're only running at about 80% capacity to try and, and lessen the draft. So you can float the barges in less water levels. Um, the other thing that's happening because of these, of these, um, these obstructions that are showing up, some of these sandbars that are showing up, they're shortening the tows, meaning that one, one uh, tow boat, tr uh, tugboat can only push about 25 barges, 20 to 25 barges instead of the normal 30 to 40 barges per tug. So what that means is by the time you add up both of those, we're running at about 50% capacity. So the fact that the water levels are lower, even if we can get grain transported without any kind of obstructions, there just isn't the volume being able to pass through uh, on the Mississippi River that we would normally see in particular at this time of year when we get into the peak of corn and soybean harvest. So to give you an idea of what that means for pricing, um, now this is the average price for a, a tow, a, a barge tow between uh, Cairo, um, Illinois and Memphis, Tennessee. So there's a stretch of the river. And again, I pick kind of that Southern Illinois uh, uh, region as, as where a lot of the grain, corn and soybeans would flow to that point. And this would be the, the cost to, to move it from those that mid Mississippi River uh, range into the Gulf of Mexico, into one of the ports at New Orleans. Now, this is an index, and it's kind of a weird thing how they, how they quote these prices. But let's just look at the absolute levels and not worry so much about what this means dollars per ton. So typically what we've seen over the last, now this is a weekly average, and it's again, the average for several different locations along the river. So it's kind of an average of an average. But if we go back into July and we look at kind of the rates that would normally be charged for grain movement uh, during that time period, we're anywhere from typically about $350, $400, uh, or an index of 300 to 400, all, all the way up to possibly 800. As of last week, this is last week, not this week, it was 2430, about 2428. So we've had seen a massive increase in the cost of river transportation. What does that mean? What's the alternative? If you can't send grain by barge, you have to send it by rail. And so this is a map um, of, of the Mississippi River. Let me just point this out. Here's the Mississippi River right here. Here's Memphis, Tennessee. Just if this is the lower part of the Mississippi. Right down here is New Orleans. Over here is, is Houston and Galveston as alternative shipping points. So a lot of the product that, that goes by barge, both grain going down as well as fertilizer coming back up, um, it, the, 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 is, is in this, what we call the lower Mississippi. So if we can't get it by barge, here's the alternative rail routes. So I, I've tried, these are color coded based on the information. This is actually information I got from US Wheat Associates. They have a really nice interactive mapping system where you can start to trace some of this stuff out. So to, to get you to think about these alternative routes. So if you can't do it by barge, you have a vessel that's being the, an ocean vessel that's going to arrive. Nobody wants to pay demerge charges on an ocean vessel. Um, you're looking at what can we do? Well, the quickest way, uh, it's, it's going to be a lot more expensive, but the quickest way to get grain is obviously by rail. So the blue lines, especially here in the Western portion in, in Texas, that's the BNSF lines. 
green lines. So it'd be the green lines like running through Arkansas and Louisiana. That would be Kansas City Southern Rail Line. The pink would be UP or Union Pacific. Um, the gray, which is over here, would be Norfolk Southern. And then the purple is CN or Canadian National. So this would be the purple line right here. I just want to give you an idea. There are a few rail lines that go directly into New Orleans and, and can go along the river to be able to load vessels. But we don't have the rail delivery capacity in New Orleans that we do, say, out of PNW or even out of Houston. So I know there are there's talk right now of some of those ocean vessels being diverted from New Orleans into one of the Houston ports to get loaded. But again, there's a cost to doing all of this. The reason I'm bringing this up is it's this blue one. If we start to see a lot of grain movement from, from let's say, from the, the Iowa or Nebraska or Oklahoma into the New Orleans ports using the BSN, BNSF rail lines, that raises some concerns about what's that going to do to our freight rates up here in the Northern Plains. Now, so far, we have not seen any major adjustments in basis levels. We have not seen any major adjustments in secondary rail markets as of yet which is a good thing for us up here in the North. But if this uh, barge disruption continues for much longer, we may start to see some of those rates adjusting. The biggest limitation in talking to some of the people from BNSF is that they have plenty of cars. They've got extra capacity when it comes to locomotives, but they are very constrained and short of crews, at least crews that have been trained and certified to be able to operate as, as engineers. So right now, the constraint is the number of people that are available to work. And obviously, depending upon relative freight rates, if there's more money to be made in this, in particular for moving trains into the secondary market down here in the south, that may pull some of our transportation away from the northern plains. We will have to wait to see if that's, if that's going to happen. It is something that I'm trying to watch very closely. My last slide, and I just also want to bring you up to speed on where we are with the railroad and the union agreement. Um, so uh, late last week, uh, we got some new information. So if you remember back to September 15th, there was a tentative agreement between the railroads, and there was five different railroads, and there was nine or 10 different unions that the railroads work with. They, they came to a tentative agreement, but all of those things had to be ratified. Those, that tentative agreement had to be ratified by each of the unions and the union members. Well, as of last week, the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees rejected the agreement. They rejected it by about 5,100 versus 6,600. So 51 for 6,600 against. So they rejected that. Now, so far, four of the unions have approved the agreement. This one has rejected it. And there's seven more unions that are scheduled to vote somewhere in, in this October all the way through mid-November time period. So what's happening now, two things. We have, uh, we have extended the cooling off period, which we don't have a formal deadline on right now. It wasn't announced. There's still time for this, uh, the, the union that, that I just mentioned, the maintenance and way employees, um, to be able to renegotiate and come to terms before the deadline. This does not mean that there's going to be a strike that's imminent. Um, there are still other unions that have to vote on this, these issues, but this is going to be an ongoing story for a while. So here's my point that I want to remind everybody, once again, if we start to have slowdown in barge traffic, increased uh, demands on the rail system, and now all of a sudden we have some additional employee concerns or union concerns with, the, um, with these negotiations, uh, I'm going to be watching and listening and talking very carefully to people within the industry to say, our, how is our performance? What kind of rail performance are we getting out of here in the Northern Plains? And, I, and I'm not the only one watching this, obviously. There's a lot of people um, viewing this with, with great detail and trying to figure out what's coming next. So very brief update on what's happening. Um, again, I'll be available for questions in a few minutes. Uh, with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And I will hand things off to Mr. Tim Petrie. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie here, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. I'd like to give you a quick update on the cattle market and the lamb market and a lot of things going on. Again, like I said last time, I could talk to you about an hour. But we're going to start off with fed steers. Again, more interested in feeder cattle up here, I suspect. But the two biggest things that are 
affect feeder cattle or fed steers and then corn and <clears throat> frame covered the corn that were kind of in a trading range there instead of going up, 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 which, uh, you know, is positive for feeder cattle. But anyway, uh, you know, always good news and bad news with the market. Uh, news on the fed cattle side is that we're higher than last year by about $20 and have inched up throughout the year, maybe not as much as originally thought on and what the futures said a while ago, but uh, all the things that Brian talked about are uh, a part of that, although we, uh, again, are higher than last year, expect them to go uh, higher than next year, so doing about $20 higher. And in fact, we're up uh, the highest there was just in mid-August for the year when we're up at 146.88, and last week we were 146. 23. So we're right at the yearly high, and those actually go back to 2015 uh, was the previous point. They were that high and expect them to go higher. And, uh, uh, you know, the feeder cattle, the big thing is looking at the futures for next year is when those feeder cattle being sold now will finish. And so uh, on the top of the chart, there are those uh, gold squares there that are next year's futures, which again, we're up another $10, $12 and are nearing record levels on fed cattle. In, in the last record high in 2014 was uh, one the average for the year, monthly average for the year was 153.84, I think it was. And if you average those six futures contracts across there, comes right out to, to 155. So that would be a record year for fed cattle next year if everything comes through, but a lot of things affecting the market. What's supporting the market is in spite of our domestic economy that's somewhat struggling, beef is still selling pretty well. And then on the export market, we're doing gangbusters. Uh, we, uh, are going to set a record all-time high both in volume and, and value this year for beef exports. And uh, just the latest data is for August. We set an all-time record there. There's some headwinds there, although as well, uh, you know, Japan and Korea are our best customers, but China has just came on like mad as you see the goal line there. And actually last month, uh, China moved up past Korea in second place and it's just a hair under Japan for the top uh, export market for beef, which is kind of phenomenal. But again, a lot of headwinds there. Uh, we haven't discussed it before in the, in the talk here today, but you know there are issues with China, China and Taiwan and geopolitical issues and, and so on there. So that market could uh, decline and something we have to very much watch because we need these record exports in order to keep fed cattle futures up there where they are at record levels for next year to support feeder cattle. Oh, let's go to the calf market. Again, good news and bad news there. The good news is we're doing a lot better on calves than we did last year throughout the year. We've been about $30 a hundredweight higher supported by a lower supplies. We've reduced the cow herd now, including this year will be four straight years. We've got a million fewer calves to sell this fall, so certainly supporting the market, but uh, kind of, you know, a little bit on the bad news side, we've reached our seasonal peak, and uh, this time of the year, you see that purple arrow on the bottom. By the time we get into mid-October, into the 1st of November, you know, we, we tend to get down to seasonal lows there for a, a lot of reasons. Uh, the... Uh, you know, the, the calves tend to be unweaned, balling calves coming to market now. This week is going to be our first major test. We haven't really sold many calves until this week, but, if, you know, all the markets are seeing uh, pretty good runs this week. And I just to continue to expect them up now as, as the weather continues to cool off and, and cattle are brought in off pastures and, and so on. So we're going to for sure see seasonal weakness this week will probably be down over last year, but again, still in much improved prices. And there, there is certainly support there by the time we get down to 190 or above. Uh, one of the problems with it, that we're having is the uh, 
winter wheat crop is being seeded into dust, not coming up. And so there isn't winter wheat grazing, which would really, really support or would help to support prices because they would be after these lighter weight cattle to put on winter wheat and just very little interest there. But then by the end of the year, again, uh, we do expect them to, start after going down here for the next month, maybe uh, back some improvement that as the farmer feeders get their corn in and come back and want calves and then now they're weaned and, and they've had fall shots and they're bunk trained and so on always helps as you see there on the right hand side to bring the market up. So, you know, the good news is we're going to be above last year and, uh, and uh, then looking to next year, there's no futures market, but we expect even higher prices next year because we're going to have a lower calf crop uh, next year. Uh, you know, again, corn is the big unknown there. And so we'll need another a really good corn crop next year and, and fed cattle like they are, but it looks like better times ahead, ahead there. So go to the heavyweight yearlings, kind of the same story. They're not quite as up as much over last year. The red line, again, is this year and, and the blue line is last year, but they are better than last year. Uh, not up quite as much as calves because the uh, uh, corn prices are higher than they were last year and it affects these heavier weight feeders, steers that go into the, uh, you know, have to go into the feedlot now rather than the calves that can wait. But anyway, uh, stronger prices than last year. Uh, you see there, uh, the, 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 the futures are, are lower there. The red bars are the futures for the rest of the year. The October futures are close end of October and November. At, but you see that the cash market is higher. So I've got a square around the September futures. The September futures closed the last week in September, obviously. And uh, But I just want to show you the nice positive basis that we have up here on these 800-pound steers over the futures. And uh, that's driven by a number of things. One, last time I talked to you about the difference between the Southern Plains and, and the Northern Plains, and we see a, a big difference and prices there. And so uh, up here in the Northern Plains, we have a positive basis, very dry in the Southern Plains, selling a lot of cattle, a lot of heifers coming to market that would have been replacement heifers. So that's uh, uh, affecting their market. Uh, corn prices are a buck higher down in Texas than they are up here in Nebraska up to, to uh, you know, North Dakota. They're 775, 780 corn down there. And so that affects their prices for these heavier weight yearlings too. So, you know, the, the cash settlement price that the futures close on uh, yesterday was uh, right there about uh, 175, but there was a wide, wide range in difference in the markets that go into that cash settlement price. This was Tuesday is the last one at 175. Phillip, South Dakota on Tuesday, the average for seven to 899 wheat cattle, which are in the cash settlement price. At Phillip, South Dakota, they were 192. And at uh, an auction in Texas, they were 147. And so that's a $45 difference for the same weight and grade of cattle from Phillip, South Dakota down to uh, uh, an auction in Texas. And so, uh, the, so the futures then settle at the average of all those markets, which averaged out to 175, but we're higher up here. And so I expect that to continue. So when we're looking at North Dakota prices, uh, looking out at the October and November futures, we we'll, should do better than that on the cash market here. And then going up to next year, again, like uh, fed cattle, we see uh, higher prices through, uh, throughout the year above this year, getting right up there by uh, the October or the September uh, futures for next year uh, right up there at at two hundred dollars, indicating again the lower supplies that we're expecting, and you know that's you know keeping corn about where it is now. So, just kind of want to finish up on lamb. Uh, if you've been following lamb, price has been a disaster this summer. Lamb prices, both fed lamb prices to start with and feeder lamb prices, just absolutely crashed, and it's about a half hour explanation that I don't have time for, but just to, about what happened is, you know, on the top there, that blue line last year, fed lamb prices got really, really high because the white tablecloth restaurants opened up and their 
cupboards were bare, so they came in and bought lamb and bought lamb, and there was a good demand, and, and people did buy lamb during COVID at the retail stores and, and liked it, so there was a good demand there. But when the, when the white tablecloth restaurants got uh, all filled up and ready to satisfy their customers, then, uh, you know, gas prices went up and all those inflationary things that Brian talked about uh, happened. And so then, uh, and even on, on particular on the East Coast and place in New York City and so on, they did have some more COVID problems and some restaurant problems there. And so then, uh, you know, the demand backed off and the feeders, then the, the feedlots held on to some lambs thinking that the price would come back. And then it just kept going down and down. Pretty soon we got 200 uh, pound lambs and and they, they get out of condition. So then, the, and this has happened before. It happened in 2009 and it has happened before. And so, you know, lamb prices just crashed. But I think they're going to come back some, you know, th that was kind of anomaly there, those $250 plus fed lambs. And, but we're going to come back and get back up to average lamb prices and, and do okay into next year and so on. But we're uh, really struggling now. And then back down on the feeder lamb side, the same thing. And then the higher corn prices this year than last year are funneling into that too. Just one little thing there that I want to end up with from a marketing standpoint for producers. Uh, there still is optimism in the sheep industry. And so particular up here where uh, in the Northern Plains, there's a demand for you lambs. And I just picked, uh, you know, Newell's having, Newell South Dakota's having a sale today, but uh, last week in Newell, you see uh, circled there in purple, a nice premium for the ewe lambs that were separated off from the weathers and sold uh, uh, separately, $50, $60 in some places better. Uh, Bowman has had some uh, premiums for ewe lambs. And so uh, I think producers that, are, that have lambs to sell, check with wherever you sell, be it Aberdeen or Bowman or, or wherever it might be, and uh, see if they would recommend you uh, sorting off your ewe lambs from your weather lambs and and uh, and trying to get a premium there. So with that, uh, we'll turn it over to Dave. So just some really brief comments about uh, some things that are going on in energy and actually kind of springboarding off of uh, Brian's comments about the uh, inflation reports, the PPI yesterday and the CPI uh, earlier today. Uh, First chart is just looking at motor gasoline supplied. So this is uh, leaving the refineries and, and making it to that, that wholesale rack. And what I really want to do is kind of compare last year and this year. So the, the red is, is last year's uh, number. So this is physical product moving uh, versus this year. And of course, if we look, compare the two, we can see that, that this year's line for most of the summer has been lower, if not substantially lower than last year's. And as you know, Tim made it, made a mention of, you know, we've had very high gas prices, uh, in part because there was strong demand, but also because we have somewhat limited supply. Uh, and so this is something, you know, that you know we, we would expect. But the big question is what's going to happen uh, in coming months as we may be entering recession if we're not there already, uh, as prices remain. A high for gasoline. The one thing I point I want to get across, and I know we talk about it pretty regularly, is the difference between prices and price levels and inflation. Uh, so, you know, if we're talking about an individual price, like the price of gasoline, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, if that price goes up, doesn't mean that there's necessarily inflation in the economy. Uh, the other, the other thing that kind of goes along with that too is energy is a input to a lot of different things, and so when energy prices rise, it can lead to inflation. Uh, more quickly than other products. Kind of di digging a little bit deeper than Brian did into the inflation numbers just on, on the consumer side, uh, because I think it's interesting. We actually saw a decline in energy prices uh, last month, uh, driven in large part because of the, the decline in, in gasoline prices. And that's really because we left the, the summer driving season. And so that, that, that use, those use numbers for the summer, which were already weak, you know, are, are falling even more. Uh, and that's, that's driving that, 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 that higher line energy number. Uh, Power is a little bit more expensive and the natural gas is, is even more expensive and a lot of that. And, and that's really kind of surprising because it is, you know, it's still summertime. We might, you know, typically be, be getting ready for winter filling up uh, some storage, uh, but a lot of that's being driven by what's going on in Europe. 
And again, looking at what's happened this last month versus the last year, of course, across the board, you know, energy has been one of those big drivers of inflation, uh, you know, from, you know, these different consumer products, just energy as a whole, uh, you know, has had this significant impact on the economy. A couple of things to follow, you know, and I, I think that it follows naturally, uh, USDA did cut 50 million bushels uh, from ethanol use for this, this market year. Uh, not really surprising. Question is how much further they might have to go. Uh, right now, the expectation is still for uh, significant ethanol production uh, for the next next bit here, almost a you know almost a twelve month period. But you know if, if the economy really starts to dip, if those gasoline numbers really you know continue to fall, uh, you know that that number could be cut substantially. And we've actually seen a significant uh, reduction in ethanol production production in in September and now into October, uh, much lower than we thought. We were expecting a decline to some extent because the, the summer driving season's over also because a lot of uh, corn ethanol refineries have switched to doing maintenance in late summer prior to harvest uh, and, and the new crop uh, being delivered. Uh, but it, it's even much lower than that. And, and so that's really kind of a, a cautionary tale specifically for corn ethanol, uh, but also for, you know, transportation fuels in general. Uh, on the fifth OPEC is, is, is announced it's going to start cutting production. Uh, so that should lead to higher prices, um, a million barrels a day, which is, you know, about, you know, a little bit more than 1% of national or national, excuse me, global supply. So, I mean, it's pretty substantial uh, and, and, and bullish for prices, uh, which, you know, compounded with the, you know, already uh, inflationary period that we're in really doesn't help. And then one thing really looking forward to the winter uh, that I'm wondering about is, is what's going to happen with the price of natural gas, especially as it relates to home heating. I think that everybody should be ready for a really high heating bill this winter. Uh, almost certainly the, the highest you've ever had, unless you just moved into an extremely energy efficient home, uh, driven in large part by what's going on in Europe. Uh, the, the demand for, for natural gas globally is, is you know, at historic highs. Really, we're getting into that period where you know, deliveries are not going to make that much of a difference. There's only so much that we can do in terms of, of getting product to, to Europe as, as supplies from, from Russia you know, are, are, are being cut. But those prices are going to remain you know, at, at probably near historic highs for this period of winter. And again, it, it, it's going to be it, it's going to be interesting when we start getting our bills, especially if we have a cold winter. Uh, you know, we could definitely see uh, some shocking things. This might be one of those times where you actually notice that you're paying a, a bill for your natural gas because it could, could be a significant uh, increase, you know, you know, hundreds of dollars easily uh, on, on a monthly basis. Uh, so that was the only comments that I had. Uh, I know we're coming at, at the two o'clock hour, but we're definitely happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, our next webinar is less than a month away. It's actually pretty quick on, on November 11th, uh, that Thursday, uh, just prior to the, the Veterans Day holiday. Mm -hmm.